Smith in his 20s. He's this uneducated, unreligious treasure hunter. Okay, uh -huh. the reason why this perks me up so much is because Jews, for example, there's just tropes that get recycled in anti-Semitic literature and jokes and pictures and caricatures. And one of the most cruel and fraudulent tropes against Joseph Smith that has existed since the 1830s is this idea that he was nothing but a menial treasure digger, okay? And so just like I can't even say what the anti-Semitic tropes are here to compare them to the anti-Mormon tropes, but this is really one of the most heavily debunked tropes Calling Joseph Smith a treasure digger is akin to a slur against Jews that I'd have to bleep. Wow, that's that's some snowflakery, really, for you. All of the people that tried to get the plates from him. That's a really good point, Don, mm -hmm. that like he did mm -hmm. find the gold plates. Oh, people heard Joseph had some golden plates that they wanted to get their hands on. Does every grandma who replies to an email from a dude in a cyber cafe, turn the dude into a Nigerian prince and magically make millions of dollars trapped in foreign bank accounts appear? A thing you want presenting itself without evidence doesn't make it turn into the thing you want out of thin air. It's called being scammed. It's called being catfished. It's a very popular concept. Uh, MTV did nine seasons on it. And I'm not saying that people can't change. People can change. Historians should tell only that part of the truth that is inspiring and uplifting. Well, I'm only going to tell you the most inspiring part of this Honda Accord. No one can deny that that's a car. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm selling it. I, you're going to go look up Kelly Blue Book. Don't you know that odometers idolize the truth? Uh, and I just, I, I don't believe that they were conspirators, uh, co-conspirators with Joseph Smith. Personally, if I'm going to leave the church, that is a barrier that I need to deal with, that I need to grapple with. Critical thinking. Do we want it? Yeah. Do we know how to get it? I'll explain. <laughs> Welcome back to the Mormon History Hoedown. I'm going to be taking you through the overall truthiest, true, realest of real explanations of the Mormon religion from start to finish as much as Johnny Harris wanted to get into and that I thought was applicable to expand upon. Taking clips from Johnny Harris's YouTube video and also taking clips from what faithful Mormon programs like Midnight Mormons and Saints Unscripted have to say so trying to make this as comprehensive as possible, give you a good landscape. Maybe you are a never Mormon and you watched the video that Johnny Harris put out. What do ex-Mormons named Kara Burrell have to say? Well, you're in luck. Is there things that they left out? And maybe you are Mormon and you watched it and you're like, I'm really glad for those things that they left out. A morsel more of information would just be devastating. This podcast is going to be coming out weekly and I have so many more comprehensive breakdowns, so sit tight. So before I get into all the future episodes that I have planned, there's 50 of them. Don't worry. I just wanted to be a guide to understanding the Johnny Harris video for people who wanted some more information. Uh, my name is Kara Burrell, and I'm a comedian, and I worked at Mormon Stories Podcast as producer and co-host, and I still make appearances over there monthly with the John Larson. And if you want to know my story of how I left the Mormon church, which was about four years ago, you can check out um, the video that I just released. The podcast is available on all the platforms as well. Um, that episode is called Why I Left the Mormon Church, Kara's Untold Story. And I didn't intend for um, this, like my second episode, to kind of be a response to the apologetics. But if you guys like that, I can I can explain Mormon history in this way all the time. But I just... I didn't want it to come across as like too combative where I'm just like into the camera, <laughs> just like eyes glazed over and just annoyed with life. But I do find responding to what actual believing Mormons, what their spin is, what their reasoning is more interesting than just me telling you about it. So if you agree, I can do more videos like this in the future and I just launched this nonprofit, the nuance hug foundation. And, uh, it's just a nonprofit for people who need more resources and validation and lulls in the sex Mormon space. So all donations are tax deductible in the United States. So if you'd like to 
keep the lights on and keep the podcast funded, please check out the links below on where to donate because every little bit really does add up. So thank you so, so much to all of my Patreons, all of the hoes down and ho down. Uh, really, truly donations make all of this research and recording possible. So like I mentioned in my last episode, my first episode about how and why I lost my faith, uh, had a lot to do with my wholehearted disagreement with who this Jesus Christ figure even was. And then later on came learning a lot of these things that I'm going to get into. So it's important to note that just for members of the LDS church, they are not stupid for not knowing a lot of these things. It's, it's just a fact that so much of this church's founding has been whitewashed or hidden from us. And it can be super difficult to even put into words what it feels like discovering some horrifying facts about your church's founding and actions taken by, you know, the early church leaders and prophets and, and then the impact of those teachings. So growing up, you were really led to believe that the faith promoting stories about Joseph Smith aren't just faith promoting. They're like actually historically true, but through the course of this podcast and future episodes, I think I'll be able to clearly lay out just how much there's just been a whole crazy amount of deception uh, at play. The paradigm basically goes that anything that's not faith promoting is told to us that that's just anti-Mormon lies. And the facts of honestly true Mormon history is just not that faith promoting. Uh, but this church, at the end of the day, it's still it's it's more than its doctrine. It's more than its history. It's got a culture and a community that you settle into. And sometimes you just get caught up thinking that like, okay, I shouldn't go looking into Mormon history because smarter people than me have read the information and they still believe and digging into the past is just a whole danger zone of, you know, who's telling the truth, where they get their sources from. I'm just got to trust these feelings that it's true. And here's an example of how members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are taught to approach learning about their church's own history from a seminary lesson of LDS church, just like this year. And it says, it's important to remember that historical details do not carry the saving power of covenants, ordinances, and doctrine to be distracted by less significant details at the expense of missing the unfolding miracle of the restoration is like spending time analyzing a gift box and ignoring the wonder of the gift itself. This is our lives. This is something that you stake your entire life to. It's a lot less like a gift box and it's more like a car. Gift boxes generally have gifts in them that you're like, thumbs up, you went out of your way to think of me and here is the thing inside of it. You were specifically keeping me in mind and I'm gonna enjoy and receive this present. No, it's, the analogy that's more apt is a lot more like a car. But from the church's perspective is knowingly like selling you a lemon. You don't invest a lot when somebody gives you a gift, okay? If if all I had to do was just accept Jesus Christ in my heart and never think about him again, <laughs> that would be one thing. But but buying something that is a humongous investment that you're going to put your life on the line in, your family in, is a lot more apt of a comparison. And this is uh, from a seminary lesson that somebody sent me that basically every Mormon teenager is expected to attend seminary classes daily or weekly from ninth grade to 12th grade. And I'd say for me, I went to an all Mormon high school. (laughs) Mormonism was my entire life. You know, I was instructed by my religion from a seminary teacher trained by the church for 50 minutes a day. But what the instruction of my entire life really was, is just being trained to grow a testimony of the truthfulness of Mormonism let my seminary teacher, Brother Fletcher, put a crown of thorns with a book on my head and shove it down because he said, don't do anything that will make Jesus cry. Ah, so you think this is bad. Jesus bled from every poor. Do you really want to go disappointing him? And Brother Fletcher's son was the runner exposing himself on BYU campus to ladies. Convicted exposer of his genitalia on BYU campus a few years ago. So I just thought I'd bring you that hot goss. I don't even know if I should be saying that, but Brother Fletcher, if you didn't want me to lose my testimony and remember facts like that, you should have spent more time as my seminary teacher teaching me 
about Jesus Christ instead of making me feel like Jesus Christ. Oh, Carrie, you went out of your way to get quotes and put them on screen. Yes, I did. I was very thoughtful. So D. Michael Quinn, fantastic church historian, um, excommunicated as part of the September 6th. Don't worry. Episodes on all of this to come. Still faithful to the end. He said that Mormon historians are told to write church history as elementary as possible. Historians did not create problem areas of the Mormon past, but most of us cannot agree to conceal them either. We are trying to respond to those problem areas of Mormon experience. Attacking the messenger does not alter the reality of the message. Comment section. So for all the faithful Mormons who uh, might have missed what D. Michael Quinn just said, if you were in the kitchen grabbing a cool pop, pay attention to this part right here. Because I'm fine with being attacked on the information that I'm sharing if you have a better source and you have a, a way of you looking at it. The Nuance Ho is here for you all day. But I thought it was really funny in the comment section last week. Somebody was like, whoa, I have some scoop on you, Kara. I know somebody who said that you were not a very faithful Mormon and you enjoyed breaking all of the commandments, even the forbidden ones. And he's like, I'm ready to share sources. And I'm like, ooh, a conspiracy theory about myself. This is so new. This is so fresh. I hope that it's somebody I went to high school with who saw me dropping it like it's hot on the dance floor to get low. And I knew all of the lyrics about walls and sweat dripping from balls. If that's your story, please lay it on me. And there's also stories of uh, D. Michael Quinn saying that uh, Boyd K. Packer, the apostle, once told him that I have a hard time with historians because they idolize the truth. The truth is not uplifting. It destroys. Historians should tell only that part of the truth that is inspiring and uplifting. Well, I'm only going to tell you the most inspiring part of this Honda Accord. It has seats. It's definitely got chairs in there. And it is a car. No one can deny that that's a car. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm selling it. I, you're going to go look up Kelly Blue Book. Don't you know that odometers idolize the truth? So that brings us to Johnny Harris. You know him. You love him. The uh, popular journalist and YouTuber who has, as of right now, 4.4 million subscribers. And on the specific video, we're going to be getting into 1.9 million views on this video. Um, that's gone all over the internet, been quite popular. I have done a satire of it. We're calling my Mormon character Breadlin. Weigh in in the comments if you like it. So uh, Johnny is known for his educational and informative videos, and he is an ex-Mormon. I think for the most part, he kind of keeps, you know, his personal story on the down low, but he has a video about why he left the church, and then there's this video. Maybe somebody can tell me if he has any other ones that I didn't see. Not to mention the visuals and the graphics, which are also pretty sweet, but I just thought it was funny that Johnny has a Patreon and he reads Better Help ads for funding, and the Mormon church has a hundred billion dollars and still hasn't touched production value. That's stunning. I will cut them some slack. The uh, temple video um, was directed by a pedophile who's currently serving six years to life in prison. Their standard for acceptable media production is just like, don't hire Sterling Van Wagden again. But just think of what a girl like me in a video like this can do. Just such a popular piece of media on the web describing the founding of the Mormon church. And I've got reactions from pro-Mormon YouTube channels, Saints Unscripted, and also gotta have them. The boys over at Midnight Mormons, now Russell M. Nelson approved, <laughs> and going by Ward Radio. Hey, all you crazy members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it's Ward Radio coming at you live from KBBL Studios. And our board is lighting up with calls. Okay, first caller, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Critical Thinking, first time listener, first time caller. I would like to, all right, I'm gonna have to ask our call screener to make sure none of those types of calls get in, all right. Oh, we'd like to thank our sponsors here at Ward Radio for making this content possible. Mountain Dew, and the porn filters my wife puts on my computer. As you can tell, I'm very excited to show you what the pro-Mormon side of YouTube has to say about this video. And by what I mean by has to say is actually more that it's 
it's got a lot of card in Ellis, so it's more like what they have to scream. Um, yeah, he didn't like it. Unfortunately, one of my favorite YouTubers, uh, Johnny Harris, has just engaged in a pretty heavy-handed act of anti-Mormonism. He's dunking on the church using recycled tropes. Except for calling it made-up garbage at the end. These new facts, and by facts I mean crowdsourced ex-Mormon subreddit tropes that have been recycled in this social media blender for the past 10 years and are just literal rocket fuel for my anti-Mormonism. Yeah, that's what they mean by facts. The softest, most cuddly take on Mormonism from an ex-Mormon, and he still can't tolerate it. Johnny Harris could wait by the door like he's just a kid, use his best colors for Cardin's portrait, lay the table with the fancy shit, but for Cardin, just have to watch him tolerate it. Now listen, if it's all in my head, tell me now. Tell me I've got it wrong somehow. Word Radio, Johnny's piece should be celebrated, but... We tolerate it. Now listen, everyone. The description of this channel clearly says agent of Lucifer, subcontractor for Satan, deputy to Beezlebub, mom, Swifty. You knew what I was when you picked me up. Okay, now that I got my scripture reading of the book of Taylor over and I'm fortified with the armor of God, let's jump into the truest true story of the Mormon church. So this is fun. This is interesting. So David, this pro-Mormon host of Saints Unscripted, this is why... <laughs> When I was making my satire response, really in a Mormon's mind when they watch an ex-Mormon talk about their church, they don't have a lot of arguments and it just goes to bias and like, his countenance has changed. <laughs> Joseph Smith. He's someone I know well. He's the author of a worldview that I held for most of my life. Okay. I think, I think we just need to take a moment here to talk about biases and recognize biases. Everyone is biased. I am biased. I'm a believing Latter-day Saint, uh, and that probably is going to show through in some of the work I create. Um, Johnny is apparently a former member of the church. He's going to be biased. That's probably going to show through in some of his work. So I think if you're going to talk about how everyone has biases, it's super important to say, I have biases. And if I am wrong and you can show me the evidence, please let me align myself with what is true. But I think sometimes Mormon apologetics, they go into this like everyone has biases. They could be right. I could probably be right. I work for the Lord after all. Who really knows? But at least I'm acknowledging that I have biases so that you're not afraid that my biases will show in. It really doesn't do a whole lot if you're not like, please, if there's something I got wrong here, let me know. I taught it to hundreds of people when I was a missionary. I'm a return missionary as well. I served in Mexico. I kind of feel like you're like my my doppelganger in like the multiverse a little bit. We're both white guys with beards, RMs, you know, things like that. But I'm sorry you went through that. Like, it's not hard to imagine that that must have been really, really difficult. I mean, when you're a, a Mormon apologist with an entire YouTube channel, you know all this history that you have to know now that I sincerely doubt that he knew when he served a mission and that Johnny Harris would have liked to know before he decided to serve a mission. So we both went to Mexico to teach a completely whitewashed narrative about Joseph Smith and the foundations of this church. Are you really a doppelganger though? Just, we're just two white guys with beards who served Mormon missions in Mexico where we both taught things that I, the host of Saints Unscripted, no are completely untrue whitewashed narratives about the foundation of the church we just both did that <laughs> exploitive thing as they say in mexico johnny mi casa e su casa both wholesome and sinful all of it speeding up at an increasing rate for a lot of people this was a sign a sign that the end of the world was coming and that jesus like he prophesied would come back to usher in this thousand years of glory for those who believed in him and a thousand years of fire for those who didn't. This was kind of seems like every generation thinks that the second coming is going to happen in their generation. I think even in the Bible, the, the apostles thought that Christ's second coming was pretty imminent, or, or I think that's a, a, a viewpoint of Paul in the New Testament that, hey, it's happening, it's happening. Yeah, uh, that doesn't like exactly help your point. That's like a lot of people had apocalyptic beliefs and... Joseph Smith was the prophet 
and he also had apocalyptic beliefs and they thought that Jesus was going to come back in his lifetime. So what's the big deal if that was a little whoopsie on that? Like everybody gets the second coming wrong, even our prophets. It was one of the reasons why Paul po spoke down about marriage a little bit because he was just like, we don't have time. He's coming back. There's no time for things like that. But anyways, he's right though. So a lot of these new churches that were cropping up kind of claimed to be the place that was preparing the earth for the second coming. Like they were God's chosen administrators on the earth. And this is the context that Joseph Smith was born into in 1805, born to a mother who was swept up in the... Ex That's not Lucy Mack Smith. That is Emma Smith, Joseph Smith's wife. Both, <laughs> both uh, Saints Unscripted and Midnight Mormons both take a long pause or if not like 10 minutes to be like, Oh, thoroughly researched much. Sorry. I got to come in. So guns a blazing. Hey, that's, that's not even, that's, that's not Joseph Smith with his mom. Could you guys take like even just half as long of a pause to be like, what burning in my bosom? That is not a reliable factor to base my entire life off of. <laughs> In addition to being a frothy religious environment, upstate New York was also a place where people hunted for treasure. There was this culture of folk magic and legends that led to the search for riches and jewels that were potentially buried by Spanish explorers or pirates of the past, or artifacts that were hidden in Native American burial mounds. And their methods for hunting for all this treasure were mystical and magical. They used seer stones, crystals, rods, visions through dreams, all of this to help them locate buried treasure. And young Joseph Smith was very caught up in this treasure hunting craze. I think the way that he's framing this magical tradition, I think it's a little bit outdated and a little bit misleading. He wasn't educated. He barely had any schooling. He could kind of read and write. He wasn't religious, but from a young age, he showed himself as a skilled treasure hunter. I mean, let's keep some perspective. In all of our research, we didn't find a single like document showing that he actually found any treasure, but he managed to convey to the people around him that he was an expert treasure hunter using mythical methods. So okay, so so there we go, where he's kind of framed um, as, as a fraud. All right, well, let me stop you right there. Saints unscripted. For being so unscripted, you really do go by the playbook. So let's back up for a second. I think it's important to understand a few things. So Johnny gives us a really soft take on Joseph's treasure hunting. And it's um, it's not that in all of their research, they didn't find any, you know, confirmed treasure that he that he found. But maybe if they kept researching, they would. No. So Dan Vogel, who I would call the premier historian of Joseph Smith's life, has a lot of details and found 18 confirmed treasure digging sites that Joseph Smith led. It's like I said in my little satire response of like how Mormons talk. Johnny Harris is saying Joseph Smith married 20 to 30 women, mother-daughter pairs, sister pairs, did this behind Emma's back and stuff. And it's like, oh, so you have this laundry list of everything a prophet's supposed to be. Good luck with that. <laughs> Anti-Mormons. Oh, you don't want our prophet to engage in fraudulent, disorderly conduct? Well, that's a tall order, Mr. Perfect. We're, we're trying to understand the milieu of how Mormonism came about, but we also have to understand Joseph Smith's parents and his influences directly from who raised him and how uh, he would go about to blend his own folk magic, Christianity, and then later on, like his father's dreams and Freemasonry. Joseph Smith was born into a family where his mother embraced this new religious fervor while his father was not religious, reflecting the spiritual exploration and diversity of the time. I think that is true in like the most basic of basic senses, but Johnny goes on to talk about the treasure digging here a lot. And that's something that I will need to address. We can't ignore what his own father believed. His parents were merchants, farmers, teachers, and the Smith family blended a lot of folk magic practices that for most of the church's history, they don't want to touch with a 10 foot divining rod. So again, from D. Michael Quinn, faithful historian uh, who wrote early Mormonism and the magic worldview, it's a real pain in the church's side, but 
things like this give um, some great context. Quinn goes into detail. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Despite the fact that folk magic had widespread manifestations in early America, the biases of Protestant Reformation and Age of Reason dominated the society's responses to folk magic. By the early 1820s, the Smith family had already participated in a wide range of magic practices, and Smith's first vision occurred within the context of his family's treasure quest. His first emphasis was God's forgiveness. So if you don't know, I will have a whole other videos about the first vision later, but there are many different versions of Joseph Smith going into the grove of trees to pray, not just about what church was true, but also that he wanted a forgiveness of his sins. What sins? Maybe the ones of doing illegal folk magic practices. At this time, the revivals of Western New York's so-called burned over district were bringing thousands out of private folk religion into organized churches whose clergy opposed folk magic. Nonetheless, Smith's visions of the divine gave him every reason to ignore the clergy's instruction, including denunciation of the occult. So you have folk magic practices that are all prevalent in America, but they're facing all this opposition and bias. Okay. And then you have laws forming against folk magic that were established in every American colony and later in all of the U S states, this, this treasure seeking, this form of folk magic was seen as illegal and disreputable. People who want to have good reputations don't do those things. And then the Smith family, including Joseph Smith's father, Joseph Smith senior participated in these treasure seeking folk magic activities and that he considered integral to their religious quest. Okay. Christianity is clashing with these folk magic practices. They're too disreputable. They're not Christian. They're based on the occult. Some people think that it's part of their spiritual conquest. It's just your spiritual conquest involves you telling people that you can see things and do things that you can't actually do. Actually, you're right. That does sound like a spiritual conquest. Continue. This first vision story that you hear of Joseph Smith going out into the woods to pray about which church is right. That all happened within the context of Joseph's family doing this treasure quest. And then on top of that, the Smith's family's involvement dated back many generations, including ancestors who were burning witches during the Salem witch trials. They believed in witchcraft. Joseph Smith got his stone that he used for his treasure digging and also to translate the Book of Mormon from a witch. He must have believed in witches if part of his story is that he felt like he needed to ask for forgiveness of sins from the Christian God who then appeared to him. So your prophet and his family believed in satanic things and were all signs point to they were involved in satanic things. And you have neighbors with affidavits in Palmyra and Manchester who reported that the Smith family retained these beliefs about witchcraft and the supernatural, and they never denounced it. They never denounced the occult. So I like Joseph. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'll just quote TikToks that I already wrote that went viral. So forget that I said this has anything to do with Mormonism whatsoever and pretend that it just introduces a random historical domino effect that I love. <laughs> What's a random historical domino effect? So a guy named Joseph Smith Sr. was not a stellar farmer and he invested all of his money in a ginseng crop. And when he went to go sell it, he got ripped off, leaving the farmer in tons of debt. And the son made money for the family by putting a rock into a hat, telling farmers that he could see there was buried treasure underground on their land. Like, hey, there's a silver mine down here, but there's an angel guarding it. So pay me some money and I'll lead you to it. Whoops, the spirit took it deeper into the earth. Whoopsie about that treasure. And the farmers would still pay him money, okay? And then one day he got recruited to do a treasure dig and stayed at the house of a man named Isaac Hale and his daughter Emma was a babe. Joseph and Emma fell in love, but Isaac Hale's like, you have stolen my daughter and you're a bad dude. I thought this treasure digging stuff was legit, but now I know that it's a fraud. And then Joseph was like, yeah, I know I'll get a real job. And then he went back home and used the same rock in the hat grip to write the Book of Mormon. And because I don't like any of that, my parents don't like me very much. So when it comes to Joseph Smith being forced to end his treasure digging days, so it's March 1829. Joseph is traveling around making his living defrauding farmers with the stone in the hat, as I mentioned earlier, saying that if he looked into it, he could see buried treasure. 
And Josiah Stoll, one of these gullible farmers that believed that Joseph Smith really had these powers, but he had this nephew, Peter, and Pete was not cool, a narc. And he was upset that his uncle was pissing away all this money. Okay. And he had a warrant issued for Joseph's arrest, accusing him of being a disorderly person and an imposter. So Joseph is arrested and brought before the justice and a ton of people show up to this courtroom trial because like these activities pissed off so many people in South Bainbridge, New York. So during the trial, Joseph admits what he does for a living. And he's like, yeah, I possess a stone. Um, pretty good at looking for buried treasure underground in the earth, you know, can find you a silver mine. I've been helping out Mr. Stoll with that. I can find, you know, hidden treasures, lost property. It really ain't no thing for me. That's what I'm known for. Don't get the wrong idea because was known for it. I'm actually giving it up. You guys really don't even need to get on my case anymore. And Joseph's like, it's been hurting my eyes. That doesn't work though. And seven witnesses are subpoenaed. And one of them was Joseph Smith's dad. And he basically says in the trial that he's like, okay, I understand that you're upset. I mean, I'm upset. Joseph's upset. He gets this miraculous gift from God and he's using it for treasure. I pray daily, you know, that I, I am trust the Smiths. I am, I'm a good Christian. I'm just a good Christian guy. And I pray daily that my son will use his powers for something Christian and of God. Uh, so check back later. Maybe he's working on a side project. I don't know. And then Josiah Stoll comes to the stand to testify. And he has been from the very beginning, like Joseph Smith's number one fan. He's the, the man who hired Joseph to come out and dig anyway. And still his number one fan. Joseph didn't find anything. His nephew Peter is the one who's caused all this trouble. And he tells the court that he positively knows that Joseph Smith possesses an art of seeing valuable treasures through the stone. And he's like, uh, evidence, obviously. Yeah. I came prepared to give you guys evidence. You think I'm an idiot or something? I'll give you evidence. And he goes on to explain how like we dug, uh, and found a piece of something that resembled gold. Was it gold? Was it gold? It was not, unfortunately not gold, but how would he know that we would find something that resembles treasure if he couldn't find treasure. When then Josiah Stoll is like, we found a tail feather that was five feet below the surface while digging. How do you like them apples? Yeah. And then Josiah Stoll is like, also, while Joseph was up in Palmyra, he described exactly what my house looked like. And the whole courtroom is like, Defa. And then like that girl from Dr. Phil was there and she's like, you look like every other bitch. And then finally, this Jonathan Thomas guy gets up. Are you trying to say that my buddy Joseph is not a raging success? He had us digging for a trunk of treasure. He had us digging for treasure. Like Joseph knows where treasure is buried. And unfortunately, when we went to go get it, it slipped into the earth. But he knows where it is. <laughs> And anyway, Dan Vogel just describes this courtroom scene that's really entertaining. People busting out laughing. A bit outdated and a little bit misleading. What, what generally tends to happen when skeptics talk about the treasure quest is they'll kind of present two options. Either Joseph Smith was, uh, he believed in magic and witchcraft and, you know, the occult and things like that, which makes him very weird and other. Or... He didn't believe in it, and he was actually just an outright fraud tricking people out of their money. Those are kind of the two only options that we're left with. No, sincere participants in the treasure quest recognized that this was a very Christian activity. But the idea, the Christian idea behind this practice was that if you had treasure and you did not use it well, altruistically, if you buried it and then you died before you were able to use it, then the spirit of that owner would be tied to that treasure. And it was the treasure hunter's job to find the treasure, dig it up, and use it altruistically, and that would free that spirit, that would liberate that spirit that had been attached to that treasure. Um, and, and so in a way, this was, a, this was the Christian salvation of the dead, if you want to look at it that way. This tradition is being framed in a way 
that Joseph and his family would, wouldn't have thought about it. He's trying to spin and soften Joseph's treasure digging as apologists often have to do. There's, a, there's an interesting admission right here from David. He said that Joseph Smith's family wouldn't have looked at it and frowned upon it like this. If you are Mormon and you believe that Joseph Smith used means of folk magic, he uses these folk magic elements to restore your church you're saying he's either an, a sincere believer or he's a fraud. He actually believed in these folk magic things or he's a fraud. There's kind of only two of these things. You as a Mormon, if you believe that Joseph Smith isn't a fraud, do you not also have to believe in those folk magic practices that Joseph, the sincere believer, believed in? But the question here is about the sincerity of Joseph in this practice. He's a teenager at this time, you know, or, or maybe early 20s. He, the church hasn't been restored yet. The Book of Mormon hasn't been published yet. Uh, no, he's still treasure digging long after he has the first vision. He's still treasure digging around the time that the angel Moroni comes. Even, even Joseph writing his own history is like, even angel Moroni was like, you need to repent, knock off the things you've been doing. You know what I'm talking about. So it doesn't matter if he's a sincere believer in what he later came up with doesn't matter that still uh put a lot of shade on his credibility early 20s the church hasn't been restored yet the book of mormon hasn't been published yet he's going to have traditions and and beliefs that aren't in complete alignment with you know the restoration today as we know it he's going to have beliefs and traditions that aren't in alignment with the restoration that we know today yeah no duh <laughs> yeah that's why the church has hid it for so long because it is a disreputable, fraudulent act. It doesn't matter if it was a tradition of his day. It calls into question his character. So I'm less interested in whether or not like this treasure hunting was effective and more interested in whether or not Joseph believed that it was a sincere endeavor or if he was just being a fraud. And I believe he was sincere. It's really interesting what he just said. If you picked up on it. He didn't say, I believe that you can put a rock in a hat and it will lead you to buried treasure, and it will have the salvation of the dead by releasing these garden spirits from the treasure that's buried with them. He didn't say that he believed that. He said that Joseph believed that. So do you not believe Joseph? So if something that your prophet believed that was also integral to his upbringing, him not being a con man, him living like a preparatory gospel to then restore the the gospel through these same means of folk magic. Why don't you just say, I believe in the same way that Joseph did. The da -da 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 -da. He doesn't say that. Back in the day, Joseph Smith and other people believed in this type of Christian mysticism. If that's your prophet, why do you get to uh, remove yourself from also believing the things that he believed? Because we're on a journey here to discover if Joseph Smith is a con man or not. And one of the apologist arguments is like, no, he sincerely believed it. He went on 18 different treasure digs and he sincerely believed that he could find treasure. It just happened that he, he couldn't, and he didn't find any treasure. He wasn't just out to defraud people. He actually thought. So you trust that prophet at his word. Why can't you say, I believe that it is a true practice of Christian expression to put rocks that you get from digging wells from witches named Sally Chase into hats that you can then find buried bullion or whatever. That, that that method is a way. But you know that it's not. You know that he didn't find anything. But just by a, but just by a Mormon's phrasing, they know that's your prophet. And whether or not it was common in the day, that, that really stands beside the point that it's illegal. It was disreputable. And no it wasn't seen as like a good Christian practice or else the church in Joseph's day and all the way to the present day pretty much has tried to scrub this disreputable illegal act from its history. So you can't have it all of the ways that you want to have it. Mormon apologists, sorry. I don't care if it was common to break the law in the day. We're not just talking about people who break the law. We're talking about the character of a prophet before he founded the one true church and especially if it's a Christian church that stands in opposition to things like witchcraft and Satanism. And I've done an entire episode uh, responding to Hannah Stoddard, who was on Midnight Mormons a few months ago, 
where she doesn't believe at all that Joseph Smith was a treasure digger because doing these satanic practices are not the actions of a prophet. And I'm on her side. <laughs> she's she's uh, the most Mormony Mormon that ever mormed. So, and it's in that video that I go into detail why Mormons, they cannot with any intellectual honesty actually say that Joseph Smith wasn't a treasure digger. I spent three hours completely debunking that. But the prophet of the church just so happens that before he founded it, he was doing this illegal, disreputable act of, of peeping or glass looking, they called it, or scrying. It's not called like Christian peeping or like scrying for Christ. It's not like Joseph was leading farmers to a place to start digging and like making him feel like they're about to get the treasure. And then suddenly when the spirit took the treasure away and he blamed them for the treasure not being found, it's not like he was like, oh, so close. You guys almost had it. Really, really good job digging, everyone. Let us all say a prayer to the big JC. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for guiding our treasure dig today. That's really unfortunate that the spirit guarding it was not able to be released and return home to heaven with you. Please wash away the sins of Billy, who didn't do the spell right in your name, Please know that Billy is trying his hardest to not do the satanic version of folk magic, but to do your Christian one. Billy is trying his hardest to do your Christ version that is at the exact location that you told me it was in through the rock in the hat. Please cleanse his soul so that we can definitely find the silver mine you have waiting for us. You can't really sit here and say that it's like got a Christian interpretation to it because the people in Joseph Smith's day didn't think that. When affidavits were being written up about Joseph Smith's character, when he would move into different towns with Mormons later on into Kirtland and people would go back and say, what was Joseph up to before he started the church? And his neighbors are like, yeah, we'll tell you that he did this, this, and this. They weren't all like, yeah, we just loved his Christian treasure digging. Why did Joseph Smith's own uncle, Jesse Smith, write a scathing letter to his nephews saying that you have forgotten God. You are trying to find your own treasure and your own place in heaven. Knock off this treasure digging. Was it because he like wasn't Christian enough? Or was it because he knew that this was a disreputable, fraudulent act and that he's saying to his nephews in this letter, Jesse Smith is saying like, you think that you can see things in the earth that you cannot see. Emma Hale's dad, Isaac Hale, thought that Joseph Smith was doing something disreputable, didn't want his daughter to run away and elope with him, and was like totally bummed and said, you are engaging in a fraudulent practice that I think every Mormon would agree is a fraudulent practice regardless of if Joseph had some spin to why he believed it. You don't believe that he actually had those powers. Isaac Hale didn't believe that he had those powers. He was found guilty and brought before a judge for not having those powers. But the entire proposition of Mormonism is that there's a great apostasy that Christianity got infected. Where is your argument, though, that... Everything I just said about Joseph Smith, that that's not where Mormonism got infected. It, it stayed pure, even though it needed to scrub all of this history, even though the church doesn't tell people that Joseph Smith had a criminal record. The church is still pure, uninfected. The folk magic that we either want to downplay like it didn't happen or find some type of spin about its alignment to Jesus Christ. You guys are worrying me. <laughs> The other thing that he touches on are the uh, inanimate objects that are used in the treasure quest. Rocks and sticks and stuff like that. Um, that shouldn't be totally foreign to Christians. The Bible is full of instances of God using inanimate objects to, to bring about his purposes. Yeah, sorry, David, I got to roast you again. I made a TikTok, this guy specifically once, where he was like, you know, talking donkeys and magic stones and it's like 
oh no, it's magic when it's this one, but why not all this other one? Like, also suspend your disbelief for Joseph's ones. And it's like, come on, you guys already believe in all this other mythical crap. Why not Joseph's ones? There's precedent of other unprovable, miraculous things that have happened that you can only believe on faith. And yeah, while that is true to the religious experience, when, you know, Mormons come at you and they say stuff like, some prophets took more than one wife. Some prophets, you know, took concubines and stuff. You're opening the floodgates to just anything that there's a moderate precedent for. You want to really get into that really messy territory of precedent for things. As I always like to say to Mormon apologists, if you want the faith building side of a complexity, you also have to take the garbage truck of problems that go with it. You want to play the precedent game with Mormonism? Then be my guest. Play it all day, but it's a game that you're going to lose at Mormons because as soon as you go, guess what? God sent an angel with a flaming sword to tell the prophet Joseph Smith that he had to marry underage brides in the dozens. Then you also have to go, guess what? God told Warren Jeffs to marry underage brides brides in the dozens as well. We have the stone that Joseph used for his treasure digging and for the Book of Mormon, but we don't have the plates written in the language that doesn't exist, Reformed Egyptian. We know that there's things in the Bible maybe that God said, hey, use this instrument to bring about my word. He didn't say, after you get convicted with using that thing, use it for my word. You know, you've got Moses throwing a stick on the ground that turns into a snake. You've got the Israelite high priest who has the Urim and Thummim, which are believed to be two stones that were revelatory tools for the high priest. Where's the precedent for how the church now admits that Joseph used the stone in the hat to translate the golden plates, but there is no evidence that the Urim and Thummim that were like in this box that no one's ever seen that the Urim and Thummim that he was supposed to use to translate the plates, but where's the precedent that your God, the one that you believe in, that he puts little spectacles for looking into, for translating his his golden plates to become his holy scripture, and then he's like, LOL, JK, I overthought this one. <laughs> oh, man, I have such a God complex. Will I let anyone do anything? <laughs> Satan is usually the one counterfeiting me, but this one, this is a W for you, Lucifer. Joseph, use the stone that you got from a witch while digging a well, and I want you to use it to translate my most correct book on earth. Yeah, because it's kind of weird to, that the eyewitnesses said that the plates were never even in the room. Never even in the room while he was translating that most holy scripture. Where's the precedent where God says, prophet, translate these ancient writings. It's a really good story. It ne necessary, actually, to even return to me. I'm ready to debut these golden plates to the world. And what's that? Mm, the golden plates, they're a little bit camera shy. Mm, stage fright, sweetie. Golden plates, you really don't want anyone to see you? I spent like thousands of years, my prophets, etching in their writings. And it's it's showtime. You, I Prophet's right here. He can just run his fingers over you. You don't even want to be perceived right now. Mm, I'm God. I relate to that. Now, could people use those things fraudulently and lie about them? Of course. But to jump to the conclusion that, that that's what is happening uh, when we see precedent for a righteous use of these things in the scriptures, I don't know that that's quite fair. So that's just something to keep in mind as we move forward. He wasn't educated. He barely had any schooling. He could kind of read and write. The context that you need to know to really understand this story. We're in upstate New York in the early 1800s. There is this frenzy of folk magic and treasure hunting and... Folk Christianity is, I think, a better term for it. Folk magic would be what the majority would call it as a way to kind of push it away, push it down. But it was it was folk Christianity. Mmm, that old Spotify playlist. Hey, put on some of that folk Christian music. It's, it's actually folk Christianity. Again, if it's illegal, disreputable, and gets Joseph Smith found guilty in front of a judge for doing, are the people representing Joseph at his trial for doing this illegal action? Like, folk, folk 
Magic? I'm sorry, I haven't I haven't heard that name in years. <laughs> Wait, he's on trial for folk folk magic for for glass looking. <laughs> oh man, you guys are so behind the times. <laughs> I haven't heard it called that in ages. Uh, folk Christianity, the thing we're all familiar with, where you slaughter the dog, drizzle the blood, draw the antigram, you know, get your stone from your neighborhood witch. <laughs> Clearly, okay, everyone. Brush up on your Bibles. I know I just swore on one, but if you open it up, you can clearly see that yikes, it's gone. Your Honor in Joseph's defense, he was just trying to move the story along. Can you want to talk precedent? Talk about the most obvious one. Like David just said that, yeah, can some people lie? Can some people use it for things they're not supposed to be using it for? Sure. All of that's within the possibility. David, didn't you just say that the folk magic practices that Joseph Smith engaged in were actually Christian, Christian types, Christian ones. Now, Joseph believed that he could get a magic stone in a hat from a witch. He was borrowing his witch neighbor, Ch Sally Chase's rock for a long time until she told him, buzz off and go get your own. So do you believe? It's like, again, David, do you believe what Joseph believed that you can get rocks, special stones from witches that will tell you where things are buried underground? No, of course you don't. But if you want to say, Joseph, he can't be a fraud. He was a sincere believer in this. The thing that he was a sincere believer in was witchcraft. Sorry, but like your argument completely falls apart, dude, because as we know, once Joseph, you know, goes to try to retrieve the plates, there's all these stories about uh, Willard Chase and, you know, his other homie treasure diggers who hear that he has these golden plates and he has to run from them. He has to hide them because people are going to try to find them and sell the gold or whatever. If, if Joseph Smith's old business partners and neighbors that he was in the treasure digging business with that you describe as being so Christian, why are these people so disreputable that when Joseph Smith gets the golden plates, he fears that all the other treasure diggers are out to get his treasure. They're not sitting at church being like, good for him. He released another spirit. I'll find my treasure to release my spirit. I will stay on this Christian path that God is light out for me. If I just trust Jesus Christ, I will find my own treasure. Good for Joseph. Joseph, a 14-year-old boy, movie. gets curious about religion. And after visiting a bunch of churches and finding no answers, he decides to go into a grove of trees to ask God which church was true. He sees a pillar of light, and he finds out that it's God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus goes on to tell him that none of the churches that he's been investigating are true, and that instead, Joseph is being called to do the work of God, to restore the real true church that had been lost from the earth. Johnny goes on to explain the first vision. There's one narrative, the church's standard narrative, that Joseph Smith... He saw what he said he saw, that he claimed he had this um, divine encounter that we call the first vision, and God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him when he was 14 years old. There's a whole lot of information missing from this, just like it's missing from missionary discussions, like it's missing from the correlated curriculum that church members grow up on, that there's just these lessons that are crafted by the church leaders, that there's just a whole other amount of information that's been withheld from people, and they stick their life to it, that they feel the spirit from this story with the sacred grove, um, just assuming that the leaders that told us that it happened, it happened that way, disregarding the fact that Joseph Smith told the story with many different versions. I plan to go into all these different aspects of church history in more detail in future podcast episodes to come, but the official version of the first vision that's, you know, published in 1838, and that's the best known account, but there's also other earlier versions from like 1832 and 1835 that are all mostly forgotten until there's a whole other story. Joseph Fielding Smith hiding it in his safe for years. We should have known. The church just primarily teaches the uh, 1838 account, and I would say all church members are pretty much unaware that there's so many discrepancies um, and contradictions from these multiple different versions. There's like no contemporary mentions of the first vision in uh, the 1830s. The Book of Commandments, published in 1830, is a record of foundational events. 
doesn't mention the first vision at all. There's also this uh, changing theology. Where Joseph says he saw one person and actually it was two. Sometimes it's the Lord and then sometimes it's two personages. It's God and Jesus in the uh, 1838 version. Just wandering minds want to know. God, you have your most correct book of all time. First draft follows Trinitarian view. The 1832 account of the first vision aligns with the Trinitarian view. And then when you had Joseph Smith write the Book of Mormon and the lectures on faith, what were you thinking? That you needed him to remove it from the lectures of faith and canonize things? What were you thinking? I'm not angry. I'm just frustrated. Then it turns out that God was giving a lot of people in Joseph's day in his region, a lot of similar, a lot of similar experiences, a lot of similar visions as the first vision. Turns out it wasn't the first vision. It was like the 60,000th vision that God had given out that year. Those incorrect, Joseph's true. You can actually read about all kinds of first vision experiences with the timelines looking extra suspicious. Joseph Smith had encountered, we have evidence that he knows about certain stories that directly align with the things that he said happened to him in the grove of trees. And there's just, there's no question that these sources existed long before Joseph Smith wrote about or even spoke about his own similar experiences having a vision. So by one measure, there's like 30 different stories that are interestingly similar to Joseph Smith's First vision, for some reason, the guy who was good at telling people that he had magical powers when he told his first vision story. Look at him now. He gets entire movies made out of him. The feelings God had for him, they were real. God knew it. Joseph knew it. The chemistry was real. Joseph didn't need to define the relationship. He knew where he stood. And all of the other, I mean, Solomon Chamberlain, It just sounds like a side piece name, doesn't it? Like the only comfort that I get from telling this is just imagining Joseph Smith with a bunch of backup dancers. You may have met the lovers. I'm a big funk music fan, SOS band. I know all of their songs. But I know when you're with me, you are all mine, Jehovah. That's not how the song goes. I added that. Tell me that my vision in the sacred grove was the most important one. Solomon Chamberlain saw get woohoo. In this busy, fast-paced, workaday world, I just don't have time to look into every single record of visionary accounts in upstate New York and to follow up and see if Christ's one true religion came from any of those. I'm, I'm walking right into the quote from Legally Blonde right now. You're like, really? Why this sperm? Did he follow up on all of his sexual encounters? And then masturbatory emissions could be deemed reckless abandonment. Be like, did we follow up on every single person who said that they also had a visionary account? Why this one? Why this Joseph? If you're not familiar with the uh, pro-Mormon apologetic side, of YouTube, I want you to count yourself very lucky. (laughs) I'm going to lay out some more uh, things in this landscape to give you a little bit more context about what Ward Radio is, just a little bit. Formerly known as Midnight Mormons with Quakewell, Brad Whitbeck, Carden Ellis, what they are known for. They're completely defying their prophet's counsel to be peacemakers. They never turn the other cheek and constantly disregard Jesus Christ's teachings to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you an intellectually dishonest group who are poor representatives of the religion they claim to believe in. I'm not even going to make a joke here and say they're perfect representation. Because <laughs> if I was Mormon, I would be horrified. <laughs> they want to be the cool kids of Mormonism by acting like frat guys drunk on Mountain Dew. Perfect. I feel like they want to be mainstream so bad, clown face. Like, no, we're not in a cult. Look how funny we think we are. We're so normal. Please, bro. Clown face, clown face. (laughs) And like I already said, Johnny Harris could not have given a more cuddly, sweet, soft description of Mormon history. But even still, they just don't, don't even tolerate it. 
And I want to introduce you to the brain cell burial ground of Ward Radio's comment section on their Johnny Harris response video. So the more hardlined Mormon's response to Johnny Harris's video goes a little bit something like, you can't convince me that it isn't straight up intentional deception on Johnny Harris's part. I want to get into that. So much so I'm guessing that he had to choke down his conscience to get that video to go out. Another says, claiming to have the real story is the first clue he is putting himself on a pedestal. He's a journalist. <laughs> Anyone who talks about their experiences and collects information from history and says, I'm going to tell you that story now. Who the hell do you think you are? Ox Mormons, their continence has changed. Where do they get off thinking they're allowed to have a perspective? He has the right to tell us what he understands but why is he the one that the whole world can trust to tell the real story? Pop quiz, Mormons. Does telling the truth matter? Clock's ticking. Does telling an accurate accounting of the church's founding and history actually matter? Hurry, time's running out. Does it? Truth is on the spectrum. The most truth is at 100%. The least amount of truth is at 1%. How close is Johnny Harris compared to every single prophet of the LDS church and historian and seminary teacher and institute teacher and Sunday school teacher and correlated curriculum and inside article. Who does he think he is? Think you're pretty hot stuff, Johnny, putting yourself on a pedestal. Oh, my church leader's walking in the room. I have to stand up right now and take off my hat and address them with their middle initial. Dallin H. Oaks, can I make eye contact or can I not? No eye contact? Russell Elm Nelson, just look at the ground, got it. A better title for Johnny's screed would have been how I renegotiated my understanding of history to convince myself that my waning faith is a positive thing and now wish to lead you down to the garden path so you will see as I see and I will be accepted. Then... Word Radio responded, whoa, snap, this is great. That's not a great title. It wouldn't even fit on YouTube. Word Radio, do you know anything about the character limit? Never Mormons out there? Do we see what we're dealing with? Have I not explained how nonsensical the story is again? <laughs> Anyone who questions it and speaks publicly about like, I learned some new things. I don't think this is a true thing anymore. Do you see how hard it is about the things that members say about people who leave and decide to help others see the truth and also leave and free themselves from this deception? You don't need to re <laughs> you don't need to renegotiate your understanding of history or just morality and ethics or critical thinking. I mean, you don't need to renegotiate your understanding of history to convince yourself that Mormonism isn't true. Just the truth of Mormonism is not very faith promoting. It's not like we were all like me and Johnny were born in this religion. And we're like, I grew up my entire life believing that God's prophets need to have 40 wives. I believed my entire life that God calls prophets to marry 14 year olds. And then I grow up and I go out in the real world and I'm like, that's not normal. I was just born to always believe that God calls prophets who, yeah, when they write scripture, like the book of Abraham, Kinderhook plates, the, the translation of the Bible, I was just like always raised to believe that they should be indistinguishable from a fraud, that like the books in our scriptures they definitely shouldn't match the papyri that they were taken from and translated off of that our holy books are supposed to be indistinguishable from a fraud. And it just like throws us into this faith crisis where we just have to like renegotiate our understanding of history and like what? So I will save you from having to watch the first few minutes, but to summarize, Word Radio's point here. Basically, Cardin, who is more hardlined, said this is like an anti-Mormon piece from Johnny. 
again, it's just ridiculous to even say that. Uh, but he's he's way more black and white than the other guys. He's just kind of dead set that Johnny Harris is regurgitating a disproved, debunked anti-Mormon lies, been here a million times, whereas Brad and Kwaku and their guest Don uh, don't see a whole lot wrong with Johnny's piece. So again, there's a whole wide spectrum of Mormon responses on this. And they go through a lot of little annoyances that they have with Johnny's setup, as they call it, that Joseph is painted in this way that will leave the average person watching it thinking that he's a con man. He would sit on one side of a curtain so that no one else could see. And he says he looked through these stones at the Egyptian engravings on these golden plates, and they would turn into English. And then he would dictate them out loud to a scribe. At other points, Joseph didn't even need the plates to translate. He could hide them somewhere else. And he would use his personal seer stone. He would put it into a hat. And then he would bury his face in the hat. And he said that the stone would light up with the words that he was supposed Pause. to dictate to his scribe. Okay. That's mostly just fine. It wasn't him that said that, though. Actually, That's I like have a point to make old on David that. Whitmer remembrance, right? This gets fuzzy. Yeah. Pretty fair representation of the translation. It just seems a lot more like confident about how it happened. This particular portion of this translation gets framed away from what is actually the most common thing. By the way, if they were doing exhaustive research, the most common way that the plates are described, all of these records, they're described as being translated by the gift and power of God. And I think if they were going to present the real thing, I would definitely want to nod to that. More than just like, uh, hey, he used these weird spectacles and this weird magic rock in a hat, right? It's like, to Joseph Smith, these are clearly gifts of God, you know? Right. And well, he's, he keeps framing this as like a non-religious thing, which I don't Because I was going to say, obviously, accurate. he's fully secularized at this point, and the secular can't believe that anything happened through the gift. Saying it's unscripted as well. Like, they don't quite like the setup, and this is just typical to how Mormon apologetics works, that... These are these are just groups of guys speaking as insiders to insiders that they think that this man is a prophet, not a con man. And just is the same as, you know, pick any cult member explaining why their leader, yes, in other contexts would look like a con man, but not in their context. So the first way I think to understand the general Mormon's reaction to Johnny's piece is to recognize the abundant uh, special pleading fallacy. And uh, the special pleading fallacy is very, very clear with faithful Mormons as they struggle to defend Joseph Smith. A uh, double standard comes out that is just baked into a lot of their position. Mormons know a lot of things about Joseph Smith could look like a problem but special pleading is like the key that fits every car's ignition, but it's like the only place that you're allowed to drive to is bumper to bumper traffic on the freeway. It's like, you're in a car, good for you, but you're not going anywhere. <laughs> because if you get a key that turns on every car, then so does every other person and everyone gets to sit in a car, but nobody's driving anywhere. Members of the LDS church, when talking about Joseph Smith, love making an exception for a person to do con man like things without providing a valid justification for the exemption. So it's, it's hard. Consistent reasoning is hard. So like Cardin from Ward radio starts his response to Johnny's video saying that anti-Mormons, they never pick a lane. Like Joseph Smith is an idiot until he's a genius until he's a con man until he's like a spiritual savant, like, oh, come on, guys. Which was he? Pick your lane. Oh, aha. He's a prophet. But he managed to convey to the people around him that he was hmm. an expert treasure hunter and that using mythical pause. methods. Yeah. That, again, is another time that he's trying to reinforce this, like, superpower of storytelling that Joseph Smith has. Um, which I think, like you're saying, is there to set up for painting him as a con man later. Yeah. 
I, I was going to say, well, at least he's picked a lane. I give him credit. He's going to stay in that lane, unlike other anti-Mormons who say he was an idiot until it gets time to call him the evil genius, at which time it gets called to, time to call him the con man, at which time we'll it gets to time that. to call him the pious fraud. You know, so at least he's picking a lane. It's not that it's not that complicated. What's the lane of what, you know, the anti-Mormon, ex-Mormon, the critic, whatever you want to call it. It's all that matters that if Joseph Smith wasn't such a genius at conning people with his spiritual savant Ness, no one would know what he did enough to even call him an idiot. Anyway, Cardin is like, hey, anti-Mormons, what was he, you know? Pick a consistent lane for your argumentation. And again, I'm like, eh, you want one side of the complexity, you have to take the other. Mormons view so many problematic parts of church history, honestly, is that they want to just take one puzzle piece at a time. And even that, I think, is hard to swallow, but you have to look at everything in its fullest complete picture in concert with one another. Like if Joseph did very conman things typical to what other cult leaders and conmen have done, objectively speaking, like, let's be honest, every cult leader says that he needs to have sex with his followers, wives, and children. Yours gets a pass. Yours did it because God told him to, but every other person who does it is a sick creep. But... Again, this is this isn't to pick on Mormons. Mormon God needs to pick a lane on how we should know what a true prophet is from a fake one. Is it like Jesus said that by your fruits you shall know them? That it's like one minute it's line upon line, precept upon precept, rock in hat, shovel in dirt, wife by wife, flaming sword, threatening angel by teen bride. All of this seems really weird and wild to us now, very easily like, okay, clearly this guy's making it up. Well, you could only think that if you hadn't done the complete and total research. I, uh, Don't do this to me, Johnny. Come on, bro. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to defend you. Don't say this is obviously fake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, like, okay, but well, we can't be offended by that. Like, remember, he did leave the church. He doesn't believe it. Oh, no, no. I'm not offended by it. I'm just, dang it. It's just one insider talking to another insider about how, like, those outsiders, how they just don't get it. You'll justify your leader's immoral actions while holding other leaders to a different standard. And that is dangerous. You have willful blinders on to this, but the health and welfare of everyone outside of your group and inside of it is at the feet of your biases to be used and abused in an unaccountable system. If biases are natural, if biases are natural to all of us, yes, but the biases reach dangerous levels when you can't provide an unbiased explanation for this inconsistency that our prophet gets to act like a con man sexual predator, but isn't, but other people who act just like him are, but then when there's problems to address in Mormon culture that are rooted in the doctrines of Mormonism, like polygamy and sexism, stuff like that, those get to be problems of every church. Don't we all have to deal with, don't we all have to deal with the ghosts of eternal polygamy? That's not specific to Mormonism. Just if you want to make, if you want to quit just defending your church to outsiders and you actually want to do better work within the church that you belong to, if you want to make Mormonism a healthier place to belong to, the culture that stems from the doctrines, that stem from the immoral actions of Joseph Smith need to be addressed instead of just justified because of his special spiritual status. If con man behavior will always get a pass because of your arbitrary exceptions, the con man made for himself because of his claim that God exempts him, you also open the door to normalize every other type of con man, every other cult leader that you dislike. So anyway, from there, their problems with the framings of the beginning of Mormonism are just like splitting hairs where Johnny Harris would say, you know, while Joseph looked in his hat and came up with these words off a stone, 
And like our modern take on things would be like, that looks pretty stupid. How could anyone believe this? But back in the day, a lot of folk magic people, it was common. But the guys in this video, they just where they wish that Johnny would say things like Joseph Smith saw this as a religious thing. It's like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> you want him to say Joseph thought he had a gift and power of God? That's pretty implied by the fact that he goes by prophet of God. Just like, gosh, you guys, show a little more gratitude for what he didn't bring up. So like I mentioned, treasure digging, magical worldview, very integral to the Mormonism that we know and love today, founded by Joseph Smith. Prophet, comma, treasure digger, comma, uh, and foster father. Oh, wait, what's that? He did what with his foster kids? Okay, scratch that for the record. Anyway. Be like, okay, clearly this guy's making it up. But at the time, mystical visions and treasure hunting and seer stones, this was all very normal in society. After my I, I get a little wary like people use this we're so smart nowadays type of thing. Well, obviously now it seems like this, but back then those idiots we're living in a culture that can't define the word woman and wants to chop certain things off of fifteen year olds. Like I I get I, sure, they believe some things back then that we've just We have rampant science. obesity and depression that previous generations didn't have. Yeah, like, it's very it, presentist to make these arguments that now it's better and the ancients were stupid. Well, Luke, yeah. um, I think this is just another point that goes along with what Don was saying earlier. This is the standard ex-Mormon narrative. It is. Like, 100%, this is the standard, hey, I'm now enlightened. Same old crap that they can't help themselves from <laughs> saying... No, no. Oh, it's a noble endeavor. He's not trying to pull anyone away from their faith with this video, which is no. why I don't think it. we can say it's anti. And, and I think you don't think by insinuating you're stupid if you believe that, that not, that's not a form. Uh, I, don't, I don't. These think, are the guys see, that believe I, in microaggression. Because this topic, um, this folk magic topic of treasure digging was something that was completely new to me four years ago when I was Mormon and throughout my entire life. So if you would have told me that Joseph Smith, the founder of my church, that I believed saw God the Father and Jesus Christ in person in the sacred grove, all while doing illegal folk magic practices through the power of a peep stone placed in a hat, that he would later admit to his future father-in-law that he had no such powers, and that the church has now admitted that Joseph had a career of folk magic and treasure digging, that he was forced to knock off before he found the golden buried treasure in the hill— um, I wouldn't have even believed it. Like, it just sounds crazy. It sounds like an anti-Mormon lie. I knew when I was Mormon that like, yeah, God's prophet boys don't do that. So it's not like, cause we just knew that all along. And that's, that's what God's prophet boys do. No, I think that we know that God's prophet boys don't do that. And not only, like I said earlier, not just in his story about Joseph Smith, he's also presenting a story about himself. Yeah. Right? And in that story, it's like, well, I used to believe this thing, like, well, I used to believe, but it was before I knew that Joseph Smith destroyed the printing press and about his polygamy and so on, right? And so there is this narrative that, well, this used to be believable to me, but then I discovered these things. These new facts, and by facts, I mean crowdsourced ex-Mormon subreddit tropes that have been recycled in this social media blender for the past 10 years and are just literal rocket fuel for my anti-Mormonism. Yeah, that's what they mean by facts. But this, this narrative that he gives about himself, it's really, it's the standard ex-Mormon narrative. I would say the more that one digs beyond this level you know takes on religion as a con he was a sincerely religious child who grows up to be a sincerely religious man who believes in his own prophetic claims doesn't doesn't matter if joseph smith sincerely believed that he could do it or that people believed in him that's kind of universal to the trick of calling yourself a prophet in the first place like if that's what's up for discussion that's what's up for debate like these are important things to know when you're going to be given 10% of your income and Mormon marriages center all around the foundations of Mormonism being true and the children that you bring up within it. And it's all based on a prophet who has a criminal record. And I'm not saying that people can't change, like people can change, but when, <laughs> but when you're talking about a prophet and it's only 200 years ago and it's got a, a lot of overlaps with a lot of other con men, and I'm not saying that people can't change. People can change. 
I'm not saying that people can't change. Look at Miley Cyrus. I'm really proud of her. Not talking about Hannah Montana and the costume changes. While that was very impressive, how did she do it? Miley, I really like your new album. Sounds like you've gone through a lot of growth. No, what we're talking about is people who claim to speak for God, that a lot of people claim to speak for God. And with that type of great power, if you actually do speak for God, uh, with that great power comes great responsibility. It comes down to like, do you want to believe in a God that puts the, the burden of responsibility on you to be faithful regardless of the type of prophets that he calls, but the burden of responsibility to act in a reputable way that should be exemplified, that echoes back to the behavior of the Jesus Christ that they testify of. It's like, why is the burden of responsibility on the members to believe all of this regardless when the prophets always get a pass and the house always wins. Like it's the kind of stuff that will leave you jaded. Not the best title, but it's also not the worst. And like you're saying to all of the secular people watching his show who aren't familiar with the church, I think this is actually a much better introduction than something John DeLynn would put out on like understanding Mormonism. You know, Dude, at least this the young kids fairer. are going to be seeing this. We, we, it was South Park for us. In fact, if I could poll my all Mormon high school on November 20th, 2003, after the South Park episode on Mormonism came out and what the chatter around South Park's depiction of Mormonism was amongst our teenage minds, it was like, yeah, that was pretty funny and pretty accurate except for the part about Joseph Smith putting his face into a hat. I don't know. Like, that's all I thought. I was like, why would they lie about that? Like that part, why of all things, where are they getting this rock and a hat thing? Like, yeah, I know Joseph Smith lost a bunch of pages and it can sound dumb, da dumb, dumb, dumb. Ha ha ha. But like, we don't believe that Joseph Smith put his face into a hat to translate the book of Mormon. He used the plates. Just so crazy what these anti-Mormons can come up with is putting his face into a hat. Like if he did that, yeah, I would have you make fun of it. Cause that's a dumb thing for a prophet. I don't believe in a prophet that does that. So it's like ac actually accurately make fun of my religion with like actual things and I can handle it. Like don't go making up lies about how Joseph Smith put his face into a hat. Cut to all of us 15 years later. After a temple marriage, several kids, decades of wearing garments, slow pan into our faces, spinning in black and white. All I see around me are familiar faces, worn out places, worn out faces. So yeah, you can imagine the real wake up call when South Park does a better job at telling you about your religion than the religion itself does when you base every single decision of your life around it. Enter my commentary on the importance of satire being my life and using it to critique powerful systems more than just jokes, but in fact, vital to our society. But yeah, when, especially when it comes to treasure digging, but all kinds of stuff, the church has known about this from the beginning. They prove it by how much that they have tried to cover up, like from Joseph Smith and his buddies, trying to cover up his past and get people to not speak about it. And then speaking as God saying that if people don't knock it off, that God is going to rain down the forces of heaven on newspaper editors and affidavit takers. And Joseph just playing those off as foolish pursuits of a boy. But if throughout Mormon history, there's been this tug of war that's been going on about Joseph Smith's, folk magic influences that come into conflict, his conflicting sacred grove experiences, the timeline itself, just looking suspicious, the overlapping ways the angel of Moroni is like all these other native American spirits that tell the diggers that they haven't prepared enough yet. They're like, I don't think you're, I don't think you're ready for this jelly. I'm so sorry. I need to cut off the millennial things. They just come out. And now we've come to this point in history where they can't excommunicate all of the truth tellers in the church and now the Mormon church like has admitted that yes, this is a true narrative about 
what Joseph Smith was doing with his time before being called as God's one true prophet before writing the book of Mormon. And if everybody can like go back into your putting your Mormon cap on and think back to like your seminary and your Sunday school and young men, young women's lessons that in my mind, I never even heard, I never even heard the word treasure digging when I was Mormon, that this, anything with this folk, folk magic, I never heard of any of this treasure digging before Joseph got this prophetic calling. It's basically like, he's a good Christian boy from a family and James one five. And if you seek after truth, you'll find it, bud. He goes into the woods, praise God and Jesus Christ are there. Your testimony of Joseph Smith is only the faith building parts of Mormonism that they tell you, but it's only with the push of the internet that things that people were once excommunicated for talking about that like all of the evidence that even the church that Joseph Smith founded is talking about the things that he and all of his successors were all trying to cover up. Johnny Harris, he, he the way he talks when I was a believing Latter-day Saint, I didn't realize that there were all these things and there's sort of this divide between me and sort of the believers in that, like, as a believer, you are ignoring all these things about Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. And I've graduated know, into the enlightened right. sphere so of I, secularism. I know, right. I, oh. I'm, I now know and acknowledge the things that the believers don't know or that they don't acknowledge. They sweep under the rug. That's a story that he has not about Joseph Smith, but about himself. Mormonism in general, it is like a treasure dig. It's like a treasure digging conquest. To be Mormon is to assume that you follow your prophets, to believe that they know the right way. And even when they're proven wrong and even when they have nothing to offer after all your obedience, after you think that you're doing everything perfectly, it's still you that, that didn't do anything right. It's not because the God talker guys weren't talking to God. It's because when they talked to God, he had some words for you. The story is like I... I used to think the history of the church was this way, but now I realize it was this way. Like, I have this different picture. Yeah. And what I actually want to say is, like, congratulations. Like, you learned that some of the things were not the way that you thought they were. Yeah. But now the sense that, like, I've graduated, now I get it, now I really know, that sense can actually block us from seeking further information, yeah. right? It's and so in, in my own journey... Right. Like I was I was where Johnny Harris is 100 percent. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I learned more. It's understandable. I've learned more than I knew. I have a different picture. That's great. Mm -hmm. Now, what else is there? Right. If your curiosity ends there, so is your journey. So is your understanding going to end there. But I'm yeah. telling you, there's more. There's like the complexities of knowing the church history. And then there's also the complexities of knowing what you wouldn't put up with if another church leader did it. It's really similar to how all people in high demand religions and like cults, how they make prophecies and that true believers they think are going to come true. But then even if the prophecy doesn't come true, there's like a sunken cost there and people are hardwired to still want to believe the thing. It actually makes them work harder and give more money and be more obedient because there's this blame reversal where the reason why the prophecy didn't come true is because of us, because we didn't do it right. It's not because that person was lying, just like the, all the other liars who lie about the things that don't exist, that are superstitious, that we don't have, and that there's lies to be told when things want to be gained. It's a me problem. <laughs> so that's just universal to, to so many religions. So yes, well, part of this podcast is to give members of the church who might not know some of this stuff informed consent about Joseph Smith and the founding of the church, you knowing for yourself of what you would put up with from your leader to another one. This isn't to tear down anyone's faith. It's just that you know that you wouldn't put up with that if another leader did it, you know? I actually, this might surprise you, but I actually, when I talk, th this is the standard ex-Mormon narrative. Oh, very I, much I, so. I participated very much in the culture of ex-Mormonism for several years as an ex-Mormon atheist. And it's like, okay, Mormons, whatever type of God you believe in and you've made peace with, at least you know this information that a lot of past generations didn't know and based a lot of their life on. And if you want to base your life on it, 
you send your kids on missions, if you go on a mission, the people who then convert to the church, who plan to base their entire life on it, there's a there's a reason why most of this stuff is whitewashed and most people don't know it because this story doesn't sell very well to others. And so if you want to be somebody who acts with integrity, you don't get to play this game of like, well, milk before meat. If you're putting somebody on this path where they believe that the spiritual experiences that they're having are owned and stamped by your church now and forever in perpetuity, all potential converts that you're telling the restoration story of Joseph Smith, you can't just tell the faith promoting parts about the first vision and jump to him getting the plaints from Angel Moroni and then jump to opening your Book of Mormon. And don't we feel a nice spirit when we read about Jesus Christ's ministry in America to the Jewish Native American Christians doing Protestant baptisms in Jehovah's name? It's like if the average Mormon parent knows this stuff, I think it is incumbent on them to be honest. If this story is something that you with your critical thinking <laughs> wouldn't buy, yeah, then that makes sense why Joseph Smith tried to scrub this from his past. There's a reason why I was never taught this my entire life growing up. And if you're a Mormon, you probably weren't either. There's a reason why people who talked about this kind of stuff were excommunicated from the church. So in the Ward Radio recap, uh, we have Don Bradley, who is an ex-ex-Mormon who left the church, came back, gives his commentary on that part that, yeah, Joseph, he goes and he gets these plates and people try to rob him, but eventually he gets them secured and he goes to this little cabin in rural New York and Joseph begins the work of translating these metal plates that no one is allowed to see. Joseph does find the golden plates mm -hmm. and those are handled by witnesses like there are witnesses who say we saw these and handled these. And if, if someone tells me that they found an object, that may not be great evidence for it. But if other people Mer see and handle the object, that is evidence. And Whether it's enough evidence, maybe an open question. Yes, it's still. Yes, like it is still very much an open question when you're talking about angels visiting and saying where golden plates are buried near someone's house written in a language called Reformed Egyptian that doesn't exist. Yeah, so it's just like, don't act so surprised. A journalist insinuates there's some conmanship afoot. Occam's razor, again, like, it's like, uh, what's more likely here? Because from what we know, I mean, the golden plates, they weren't taken to like all of the state's most trusted scholars and like the sheriff and the doctors and the teachers to look over them and confirm that these are ancient golden plates. All right. Before the angel took them back up to heaven. Is that why we only have this troop of yokels to confirm that they exist? No, because no, because they aren't what Joseph Smith said that they were. I'm not saying I'm not here to say that like something didn't exist like a prop, if you will, but credibility of the witnesses is about on par with like the star witness in the Central Park Five. It's like witnesses can declare things with a vested interest in the outcome, whatever declarations that they need to make. Like murderers saying that those guys over there, those are the murderers. I saw the whole thing. <sighs> Country bumpkin folk magic farmer families saying that like yeah that's that's golden plates under them's their cloths all right physical sight did i use my physical sight unnecessary my spiritual eyes see them just the same as where i see where water is underground using my divining rods like it's having reliable witnesses um and reliable sources play a crucial role in assessing the credibility of a claim that something has happened. When we're in the present day, we use that logic. So if we're talking about the witnesses to a supernatural claim by Joseph Smith, we do have to take into account their vested interest and their familial ties to Joseph. And the fact that in the 19th century, especially in these rural folk communities like this, 
Belief in folk magic and the ability to see and interact with the spiritual realm was common and people's claims that they, um, they didn't need their physical sight, that it was just interchangeable physical sight, um, and their spiritual eyes. So don't let the introduction to the book of Mormon fool you. These witnesses aren't reliable. That is evidence. And Whether it's enough evidence, maybe an open question, but there is evidence. So he's assuming Joseph didn't really find the plates that the testimonies, the witnesses don't count. Yeah. And then that gets factored into his story. And on top of the witnesses themselves, all of the people that tried to get the plates from him. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I, I think he, that's a really good point, Don, mm -hmm. that like he did mm -hmm. find the gold plates. Brad's a uh, slam dunk point here where he's like, couldn't wait to get to it. <laughs> it really holds no weight either. Like, oh, people heard Joseph had some golden plates that they wanted to get their hands on. Does every grandma who replies to an email from a dude in a cyber cafe turn the dude into a Nigerian prince and magically make millions of dollars trapped in foreign bank accounts appear? A thing you want presenting itself without evidence doesn't make it turn into the thing you want out of thin air. It's a, it's called being scammed. It's called being catfished. It's a very popular concept. Uh, MTV did nine seasons on it. So I would say the, the main sticking point of, of Mormons is the idea that people saw the golden plates. Joseph says he goes and gets these plates and people try to rob him, but eventually he gets them secured. And in a little cabin in rural New York, Joseph begins the work of translating this stack of metal plates that no one else is allowed to see. That no one else is allowed to see. W what about the, the you know, dozen or so guys who said, uh, yeah, I did see the plates. If you open the Book of Mormon, you're going to see in the first pages the testimony of the three witnesses, Martin Harris, uh, David Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery, and the testimony of the eight witnesses from people who don't seem to have a reason to lie about this, at least at different points in their life after separating from the church when they, they could have used this as ammo to destroy Joseph Smith, but they don't. And it's so, it's that's a tough one for, for people to explain. And you look at the lives of these men, especially Oliver Cowdery. Oliver Cowdery's my boy. I like that guy. He was, an, he was a great, great guy. Uh, and I just, I, I don't believe that they were conspirators, uh, co-conspirators with Joseph Smith. Critical thinking. Do we want it? Yeah. Do we know how to get it? I'll explain. <laughs> I, I know that I use it in my everyday life because it plays a critical role in assessing the credibility of a claim that something has happened. Like, is there evidence for the golden plates? We've got Joseph Story, Angel Moroni, then various other family members and friends who at most held a heavy boxy object wrapped in cloth. Like what's the reliability of the source? Do they have expertise identifying ancient things and languages? No, they don't. Do they have a potential bias? Yes. Are they all known for their honesty and accuracy? Let's see. Uh, Martin Harris said that he saw Jesus and a deer after witnessing the plates. Oliver Cowdery was kicked out of the church after telling on the prophet Joseph Smith, when he was having sex with his live-in teenage servant girl, Fanny Alger, in the barn. So are we really going to say, like, so maybe when they said that they saw the plates written in the language that doesn't exist, they were telling the truth. But those other stories were lies. The three witnesses were presented the plates by an angel. They saw the angel, they saw the plates, and they testify of that. Later, they all leave the church for one reason or another, but throughout their lives, they never deny the veracity of their testimony. They stick to their testimony until they die. And uh, Martin Harris ends up coming back to the church. Oliver Cowdery ends up coming back. Uh, David Whitmer has a split off sect of the church. They believe in the Book of Mormon to their deaths. And they reiterate over and over and over again that even though they, they had a falling out with Joseph, they saw the plates. Like that is that is real. That was a reality for them. Same thing with the eight witnesses. Several of them ended up separating from the church, but all of them stuck to their testimonies. And uh, it seems like a massively glaring omission to leave that information out of this story of the Book of Mormon. 
I'll have to do a more comprehensive breakdown of the testimony of the three and eight witnesses, 11 in total. Um, there's a lot of really good information on this that I don't have time to get into, but all I, all you need to know, like the three witnesses, like Oliver Cowdery, who is like the co-president scribed the book of Mormon at the time he's left the church. He's come back. He was excommunicated for telling on Joseph for, you know, sleeping with Fanny Alger in the barn, uh, Martin Harris, that none of these people saw the angel and the, the book of Mormon at the same time. Their stories don't align. And then, yes, all of these people at some point left the church, maybe ex all except for one. And they all joined other uh, other breakoff sects of Mormonism that they believed that Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet. So that's an important detail. It's like they still believed in a version of Mormonism that would kind of necessitate them to still believe in their experiences, whether with their spiritual eyes or whatever, with this prop that Joseph Smith made that they still had a belief that their salvation was tied to the thing that they saw. It wouldn't be advantageous for them to be in a different break off sect of Mormonism and say, Joseph Smith is a fallen prophet and his golden plates never existed, but I'm also still going to follow the Strangites. Like there's anyway, there's a bajillion things I could get into. Because the witnesses, you've got the three and the eight official witnesses and you have unofficial witnesses who had tangible real experiences with the plates and uh and we don't hear about any of that we're just kind of made to believe that nobody saw them that's not accurate I, some people think that uh they were hypnotized by joseph smith to see the plates there are all these different explanations that people try to grasp onto but i, I think they all fall short the witnesses are a really really large barrier for me personally if i'm going to leave the church that is a barrier that I need to deal with, that I need to grapple with. There's plenty of reasons to not just go with the base assumption that a bunch of these people who had ties to Joseph Smith's family, just because they never said that they that Joseph Smith made it up and they never really saw anything. There's there's a lot of explanations for that. And one of them is that, yes, this is a time of people seeing things with their spiritual eyes. They're using all kinds of subjective and spiritual language, like that they saw them through a mountain and through a city using their their spiritual eyes instead of their natural eyes to view the physical golden plates. There's Martin Harris, who mortgaged his farm and invested like $3,000 of his own money to print the Book of Mormon. So there's an incentive to promote this book. Uh, none of the three witnesses wrote their own testimony, but just signed a piece of paper that was a prepared statement by Joseph Smith. It's not the slam dunk testimony builder <laughs> that you think it is. When you were outside of the church, did you believe that you had a fully viable alternative theory to the Book of Mormon? Or did you say, I have so many other evidences that although I don't really have an explanation for the Book of Mormon. My view at the time was that, like I said, other attempts to give a naturalistic explanation of the book had fallen far short. Hmm. Okay, all right, well, here we and, go. Let's and if you had explained the text of the Book of Mormon, that still doesn't explain the plates mm -hmm. and the visions and, and the, fact and that the really, memory. really solid witnesses. It would have helped a lot more if the 11 witnesses remained loyal to Joseph's branch of the Mormon church for the rest of their lives instead of calling him a false prophet and abandoning it later on. Because it really doesn't make much sense that God would call one prophet, have these 11 witnesses. If they knew that the golden plates were real and they never denied it, why would they risk throwing themselves out into outer darkness by denying what they knew was true if they had some doubts about the entire situation to begin with? Maybe they didn't see them as literally, maybe they weren't, maybe they were not the reliable witnesses that you thought that they were and that there was some type of motivation inside of them that kept them believing, why would they risk casting themselves into outer darkness if they knew that Joseph Smith was the prophet and got these golden plates out of the ground and was a prophet of God? Why would they go on to deny Joseph Smith was a prophet of God if they knew that's what he did, unless they had some doubts? Unless there's some nuance here about 
how exactly they saw these things that could just basically be a prop that they ha are allowed to have a lot of different inferences about. Okay, now let's watch them lie about Joseph's treasure digging. Moroni tells him that there is a book that is written on golden plates that is buried in a hill near Joseph's house. And don't worry, says Moroni, along with the plates, there's the gear you need to translate these plates into English. Joseph just needs to get a bit older and he'll be ready to translate the plates. Okay, so now Joseph Smith, in his 20s, he's this uneducated, unreligious treasure hunter. Okay, um, would you feel that's a fair, unreligious, uneducated treasure hunter is a fair <laughs> characterization of Joseph Smith at this time as probably the number one scholar of Joseph Smith in North America at this point? <laughs> no, um, Joseph Smith's primary vocation in life at that point was that he was a farmer. Um, treasure hunting, things that they did were occasional. Um, and definitely, according to his own family, he was quite religious. And so. And, and to the yeah. non, to, to the secular person out there, or the non denominational, the non Mormon person out there, the reason why this perks me up so much is because Jews, for example, there's just tropes that get recycled in anti Semitic literature and jokes and pictures and caricature. Maybe people don't talk about the Smith's family's famous farming because it's kind of implied that when you buy a plot of land in upstate New York, you're going to be going some crafts on it. All right. Uh, what is more relevant though, is the portion of Joseph Smith's history. That's not the farming when assessing if he's a prophet was the, it's the, uh, it's the illegal folk magic for me. We're not assessing if he was a farmer or not. I'm not saying that I don't believe he was a farmer. You think you were a farmer, Joseph? I dare you to harvest one thing. We're not debating if he was a farmer, <laughs> okay? That's that's kind of implied. It's that if he's a prophet, was he was the illegal folk magic things he was doing before doing the folk magic things that formed the basis of the church that he founded? Not how many boiled eggs and cans of root beer possible that day. That's what the Smiths actually did sell. Now you know more. That are obvious, um, obviously just cruel and fraudulent and have definitely stood the test of time, right? And one of the most cruel and fraudulent tropes against Joseph Smith that has existed since the 1830s is this idea that he was nothing but a menial treasure digger, okay? And so just like I can't even say what the anti-Semitic tropes are here to compare them to the anti-Mormon tropes, but this is really one of the most heavily debunked tropes. You have Cardin acting like calling Joseph Smith a treasure digger is akin to a slur against Jews that I'd have to bleep. Wow, that's that's some snowflakery, really, for you. For this whole uh, ultra right wing faction of Mormon men that this podcast plays to, they sure lose their minds <laughs> at facts that couldn't even qualify as microaggressions. So if you recall my favorite video I've ever done, uh, where the fellas, they have on Hannah Stoddard to refute that Joseph was ever a treasure digger at all. Never once, never touched it. Prophet, yes. Guy who does his satanic occult stuff, obviously no. And I spend three glorious hours proving that he was. And Cardin must be on the Hannah Rod Meldrum side of this denial of history. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I, uh, I guess I wouldn't expect anything less from someone who compares the uh, fraudulent occupation of treasure digger to words that I've only heard in World War II movies. I don't know. So we have Cardin denying that Joseph even did that. Like, is that just an anti-Mormon trope? I just, I, <laughs> I'm with you. I hate when the LDS church sides with anti-Mormon tropes and publishes essays and books on it. Like Joseph Smith papers, more like John DeLynn papers, <laughs> if you ask Cardin of Mormonism and the real story of Mormonism we're getting nothing more than a recycled anti-Mormon tropes um do we have an estimate in terms of like months that Joseph Smith spent on this uh, the treasure digging oh no the Dan Vogel, would you say uh, we have high confidence that it's less than a certain amount of time my my offhand memory on that is not good enough I think that Dan Vogel 
years ago came up with a list of a dozen or so digs that Joseph Smith reportedly was involved in. Um, these digs hired laborers. I think these digs would have been all probably from 1824 to 1826. He stops doing the treasure digging in something like February of 1826. So 18, 1824 to 1826. <laughs> you guys are so cute. Yeah, they uh they really want to downplay this. So it's mm. it's not a long it's it's maybe like two years. Um, several and digs in across 1824 the period two would years. have placed it after Moroni came. A after then? Moroni, yeah. I would place, so he's not even yeah. a treasure digger before. No, he starts talking and so about that's the Book of that's significant, yeah, because he's framing it that Joseph Smith is a treasure digger, and then his like a angelic claims pop up, but actually, he's only a treasure digger for a while. It appears after Moroni comes. And before no, he gets no, no, sweet baby angel Giles. Um, yeah, they really want to downplay this. Um, Joseph's treasure digging was extensive, and there's just no way around it. It's just, it's so telling how these narratives had to change. Everyone has their own apologetic on it, what they think about it, because they know that it doesn't align with Christ's restoration of a church. Again, Mormons, I'm not trying to be mean, but it's... <sighs> Mormons, I'm not trying to be mean. These are just the facts of history. This is what you sound like. It's like, oh, probably just a few months. If it was all the way up until 1827, though, oh, I'll be so mad. If it was, if it was two years after Joseph claimed the first vision happened, trust me, that is too much treasure digging, and I will be boiling with rage, and have a some serious facts to conveniently forget. He better not have been defrauding farmers for more than two treasure digs, but it better at least be less than 20. Less than 20 is fine, actually. If it's 18 confirmed treasure digs, if it's 18 confirmed places where my prophet told gullible farmers money was buried on their land, that's at least not an odd number. I like even numbers better. Like, they just make me feel safer. But I'm fine. I mean, I guess I'm I'm fine with it being anywhere from a few weeks to a few months of Joseph doing 18 treasure digs. And it's it's definitely less than 60 months. So that's fine. And you know, like the dates of angel visitations and like God the Father and Jesus Christ uh, appearing to you. Who can keep track of all that stuff when you've got treasure to find? He's got hills to dig up and courts of law to be found guilty in. So annual visits from Native American Christian Jew ghosts every September, like starting in 1823. They're really not all the party that you think that they'd be. Five years of these annual visits. Like I get sick of Halloween candy at the beginning of fall. So Angel Moroni, can we talk seriously? Like it's not really the time or place for you to be visiting Joseph and like guilting him out of giving up treasure digging so that he can work on your pet projects. Like ghosts are, ghosts are selfish. They're like, follow the law or else you're not allowed to be prophet of God. They're huge fascists. That's actually what makes them so scary. And to reiterate, like the Mormon church has taught me, taught most of us our entire life, one description of Joseph Smith as this, this teen being this young boy in this time of great religious fervor who went out into the woods and prayed to know which church was true. And he was visited by God and Jesus Christ and told that none of them are and that he would be called as a prophet to restore a new church because all others were an abomination before God. And it's hard to fit what turns out to be years of treasure digging and defrauding farmers out of their money with a stone in the hat with what was also happening during that time with profit behavior or at least future profit behavior. So although it's, it's finally accepted by, by a uh, church historians that Joseph Smith was a treasure digger. It's usually spun as being some type of preparatory gospel or like Cardin stated here, um, that Joseph Smith addressed these things in his past. Like they've been debunked. He just basically dismisses them. But yeah, that goes back into the whole narrative of, of yeah, if it's true, 
of course he's dismissing it. Of course he's telling his enemies that God is going to, God's going to murder you in a fire rainstorm. If you bring up what I was doing before I was doing this, this dismissal of facts is the same way that Mormons handle like every uncomfortable truth about their history that like Joseph Smith couldn't have been a prophet if he practiced polygamy. So they reinterpret history. He couldn't have been a fraudster before translating the keystone of the religion. So reinterpretations that make us sleep at night to the rescue. But it's like, did he have a magic object or not? Yes, he did. Did he use it to engage in illegal fraudulent folk magic practices? Yes, he did. Did he use that same object and method for translating the golden plates? Yes, he did. Do Mormons want to downplay this because it objectively makes Joseph look like a con man before and during his prophetic reign? Yes. And they're going to criticize Johnny Harris. It's only, I just have to point out that like, it's, it's open, it's fair play for criticism when your biases tell you that when uh, your biases tell us that you can't look at information objectively. So we can, this is a game that they play and it's a game I'll play all day, baby. It's like, he wasn't a treasure digger, but if he was, it wasn't for very long. And if it was for a long time, and if it was for a long time, he just went along with it. And if it was his idea, it was just a preparatory gospel that he was doing to prepare his spiritual gifts to be a prophet. So listen up, because if you ever see a Mormon or anyone in an argument go from denying that a thing exists at all, and then when presented with the evidence that it does, they downplay it. Why do they do that? Because their denial is the mask off moment. It's a clear admission, like Hannah Stoddard consistently points out it, that in Joseph Smith's illegal treasure digging con man video that I made, that that behavior cannot coexist with a prophet whom one finds salvation in. Well, she has the she has the right opinion to do so, you know? It's a mask off moment that their denial is the thing that if it was true would be the most devastating to their case. The, the argumentation just isn't consistent because obviously it's religion, but the fact, so what if I say it's true and your testimony isn't on firm ground? The thing that you're most afraid of is the thing that's most true. So I'm afraid that that is uh, all I can fit into one episode for now and uh, split this breakdown of Johnny Harris's video, the Mormon apologetics responses to it and the commentary that you know and love. But I'm having a lot of fun. Hope you guys are having a lot of fun. But yeah, come back for part two. Um, they uh, get into a lot of the uh, anachronistic things that are in the Book of Mormon, things that don't belong, King James Bible, uh, things about the Lamanites, the Native Americans. And they also say something really, really heinous about my boss, John Dillon, <laughs> that I feel like I need to also smack down. So that should also be very exciting. Again, thank you everyone for your support. And uh, if you want to keep this funded, you know where the links are. Thanks again to everyone out at Hotown. Thanks to everyone who came out to my uh, launch party for the nonprofit this last week. We had like 60 people in my backyard show up. The cute moments of me dancing with my son that the entire party got to enjoy were brought to you by my parents not watching my kids anymore since I started this podcast and nonprofit. And everyone's like, really? I'm like, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Your parents don't, oh, they love you regardless? Mm. Your parents don't? No, my parents would never. Do your parents have a altar to Donald Trump on the top of their piano? Do they have a shrine with his signature and his books? Yeah, they don't have that either. So <laughs> everything is fair play. But no, it is all good. It's all fine. I'm really happy to be doing this, to be doing this type of content and starting this nonprofit in the space. I will leave it there. Come back for part two. And I will continue to finish this overview of Johnny Harris, Saints Unscripted, and Ward Radio. Do the do. All right. Love you so much. Bye.